Hippocrates peri aeron hudaton topon, chapter 7. Perimen penelmaton hates din epitedea kai an epitedea hod eke. So it is then concerning the helpful and harmful effects of the winds. Et de wentis quidem qui comodi sunt ac incomodi ita se res habet. Peri de ton loipon hudaton bulomai di egesastai hate esti nos odea kai ha hugie notata, kai ha cosa ap hudatos kaka e cos gignestai kai hosa agata. Plestungar meros xumbalatai esten hugieen. As for the rest, on the subject of waters, I wish to present in detail those which are unhealthy and those which are especially healthy, the bad things that normally come from water and the good, for water is a huge factor in one's health. Ceterum de aquis denceps narare volo, quae morbosae sint et quae saluberamae, et quae mala ab aqua fitiri vera simile est, itemque quae bona, pluramam enem partem conferunt ad sanitatem. And compare pleston meros xumbalatae ta hudata esten hugieen with what the author said in his introduction about astronomy, ukelakiston meros xumbalatae astronomie es ietiken ala panu pleston. The water chapters 7, 8, and 9 we're about to read are somewhat lengthy. Bulomai di egesastai means to lay out in detail. To keep our perspective, let's quickly review the organization of the first or medical half of AWP. Ietiken hostis bulatai ortos zdeten tada cre poien. You'll recall the author introduced his treatise saying the aspiring itinerant physician needs to study the following factors, which he introduced in this order. First, the seasons of the year, tas horas tu etaos. Though he introduces this factor first, his treatment of seasons comes last in chapters 10 and 11. The other three factors are local. They are environmental factors that will vary in each city the physician visits. First, the winds, ta penelmata. Next, waters and their properties, ton hudaton tas dunamias. And, finally, earth or soil, ten gain. Soil figures into the discussion on occasion, for example, as a determinant of water quality, but he never gives it its own dedicated exposition. Over the course of chapters 7, 8, and 9, the author divides water sources into five categories. The first, standing, or stagnant water. Hokosa men un estin helodea, kai stasima, kai limnaia, tauta ananke tu men teraos enai terma, kai pakea, kai odmen ekonta, hate uk aporuta eonta. Ala tu te ombriu hudatos epitrepomenu ae neu tu te heliu kaiontos ananke acroate enai caponera kai colodea tu decemonos pagetoda ate kai psukra kai tetolomena hypotekionos kai pageton hoste plegmato destata enai kai branco destata. The waters, then, that are marshy and stagnant and lacustrine, that is, from marshes or ponds or lakes, it is necessary that these are, in the summer on the one hand, hot, thick, and smelly, being with no outflow, but rather with fresh rainwater always flowing in and the sun burning, they are necessarily pale in color and inflict pain and are conducive to biliousness. And in the winter, on the other hand, it is necessary that these are frosty and cold and muddied by the snow and frosts, so as to be exceedingly conducive to phlegm and sore throats. Quaecunque igitur palustres sunt et stabiles ac lacustres, 
eas nekersest aestat esse kaledas ac crasas et olentes, cum enem non defluant sed aqua pluvia semper noa inferatur et sol urat, nekersest ipsas de colores es et prawas ac biliosas. Hitme vero glaciatas et frigidas ac turbatas prae nue ac glaciae ut pituitosimae ac raucosissimae existant. Let's study carefully this very important opening sentence on the subject of waters, one in which, by the way, your Comanian vocabulary serves you well. First, editors and commentators have questioned and played around with the order and precise distinction between Helodea and Stasima and Limnaya. For example, to some it seems Helodea and Limnaya should be specific subtypes of the generic type Stasima, though the manuscripts are consistent in the order Helodea, Stasima, Limnaya. Be that as it may, what distinguishes Helodea and Limnaya? In Liddell and Scott, Tohelos is translated as marsh, Helimne as pool of standing water left by the sea or a river, hence marshy lake. That the Greeks seemed to distinguish them is indicated not just by this passage in AWP, but by two passages in Plato. First, in the dialogue Critias, Critias tells of the fabled war 9,000 years ago between the two powers Athens and the ocean island Atlantis. Describing the abundance of Atlantis, Critias says there was ample pasturage even for elephants, the largest and most voracious of beasts, not to mention all other creatures. Nomegar tois te alois stoiois, hosa kats hele, kai limnas, kai potamus. For there was pasturage also for the other creatures, those living in marshes and lakes and rivers. And in the dialogue Laws, Plato's last and the only one in which Socrates is not present, a certain Clinius and an anonymous Athenian discuss the regulation Plato would impose on every aspect of life in his ideal state, including where fishermen may and may not fish. En ugrotero tenda, plain en limasi kai hierois potamois te kai helesi kai limnais. The fishermen, literally he who hunts in water, that's a pretty cool word, shall be free to take his fish anywhere, save in harbors and consecrated rivers, marshes, or lakes. Be sure, by the way, not to confuse ho limen, harbor, and he limne, marshy lake. The speaker adds in tois alois de ex esto te rewen, me cromenon opon anatolose monon. The fisherman is free to fish anywhere else with the sole proviso that he not use the technique of mudding the waters with juices. I'm not a fisherman and I'm not sure what the mudding juices are the lawmaker is concerned with, but in any case, note the same root tol in anatolose as in tetolomena in our text. Notice also the same confident declaration of cause and effect we saw in the chapters on the winds. Hokosa estin heloda a kaistasi makailimnaya tauta ananke da da da. Actually, you'll see ananke twice in this passage. The sentence structure in AWP is usually fairly simple, which is one of the reasons it is a good choice for a reader of only intermediate difficulty. You may have found this sentence a bit tricky, however, and it has been edited in various ways. We follow the Boudet edition as follows. The first ananke governs two propositions about the quality of the water. First, what it must be like in the summertime, and second, with ani understood, what it must be like in the winter. Actually, it goes on to govern the ani you'll find at the beginning of the following sentence. However, between the two teraos enai and the two kimonos enai, governed by the initial ananke, an independent clause is inserted, ala ananke enai, 
making the sentence structure slightly complex. Structure aside, notice that the author in this clause is not content to just observe and name these additional qualities of standing water in the summer, pale in color, liable to cause suffering and biliousness. He goes a step beyond and states their natural cause, the constantly refreshed supply of rainwater combined with the burning sun. We will see more of this. As Jacques Joanna puts it, the science of the physician here joins that of the pre-Socratic natural philosophers, called by the ancients Pusiologoi. Notice also how the author combines those permanent qualities of the water itself, qualities observable to our senses, its color, limpidity, temperature, smell, weight, like acroa here, with the water's invisible capabilities, dunames, that affect the human body here ponera and colodea. For the standing water's paleness due to the burning summer sun, compare the pale skin of the inhabitants in cities with predominantly westerly winds, whirled by the intense mid-afternoon sun. Finally, the author contrasts the bilious property in the summer with the phlegmatic in the winter. You'll recall we also saw bile and phlegm paired as antitheses in chapter 4 when speaking of winds from the north. There we showed this table summarizing the standard theory of humors in the ancient world. But the antithesis between bilious and phlegmatic expressed in chapter 4 didn't actually reflect the standard theory depicted in this table. I don't know if you caught it, but there... Bile was associated with the cold winds of the north, phlegm with the hot winds from the south. In cities facing the north winds, tus anthropus ananke kolodas malon e plegmatias enai. But the association here in chapter 7 reflects what became the standard view. Bile is associated with the summer heat, phlegm with the winter cold. What became the standard theory was spelled out quite precisely in another work in the Hippocratic corpus, The Nature of Man, Peripusios Anthropo. We showed you this passage back in chapter 4, which declares that the human body consists of the four humors that in turn govern one's health. Toda soma tu anthropu eke en heoitoi haima kai plegma kai kolein xanthein kai melainan, kai taut estin autoi he pusis tu somatos, kai dia tauta alge kai hygiene. The author goes on to explain how these humors increase and diminish in the body across the seasons. Auxetai de toi anthropoi to plegma tu kemonos, tu de terra os tota haima iscue eti, Kai he kole aeretai entoi somati, kai paratene estoptinoporon. Phlegm increases in a man in winter, and in summer blood is still strong, it prevailed in the spring, and bile rises in the body and extends until autumn. The absence yet of a consistent doctrine of humors in airs, waters, places, is in fact one of the bases for scholars dating AWP relatively early, certainly earlier than the nature of man. The author has identified some general health properties of standing waters, ponera and colodea in the summer, plegmatodestata and brancodestata in the winter. He now identifies their effects when drunk by the inhabitants on specific bodily organs and parts. Toisi de pinusi splenas men a e megalus enai kai met muomenus. It is necessary that those who drink it have spleens that are always large and stiff. The primary meaning of ho mus is mouse, from that muscle, from that me muomenos is having been made stiff or hard like muscle. Kaitas gasteras scleraste kai leptas kai termas, and stomachs that are hard and thin and hot, 
tus de omus caetas cleidas, caeto prosopon cata leleptuntai cait cat isknantai. Esgarton splena hae sarces xuntecontai, di oti isknoesin, and that their shoulders and collarbones and face are emaciated and wasted, for their flesh dissolves into their spleen. That is why they are lean. Bibentibus autem splenes semper sunt magni ac pleni, et ventres duri, tenues ac calidi, humeri vero et claviculae et facies attenuata, in splenum enum carnes coliquantur, qua propter graceles existunt. Et dodus de enae tus toiutus ca dipse rus, and it is necessary that they are famished and thirsty. Edaces aut esse tales ac siticulosos par est, tas te coelias xerotatas caetas ano caetas cato ecen, hoste ton parmacon is curoteron destae. Tuto men tonosima autoesi xuntroponesti caeteraos caecemonos and that they have inner cavities, both upper and lower, that are extremely dry, so that they need stronger purgatives. This malady is endemic both in summer and in winter. When tresque tum supernos tum infernos calidissimos habere, ut etiam forte orobus medicamentis opus habeant, atque hic morbus ipsis et aestat et hiame familiaris est. We continue to underline the first occurrence of words you have already learned in Comenius. We reluctantly didn't underline xeros, dry, because technically it wasn't found in Comenius. However, you'll recall that in the Janua de Elementis, Periton Stoicheon, we added tables to compare Comenius's description of the elements with Aristotle's. Aristotle called fire thermon caixeron, and we were kind of like, well, you know, hoping you would learn those words from Aristotle too. Note, by the way, that Cornarius in his Latin translation doesn't say driest cavities, coelias xerotatas, but hottest cavities, ventres calidissimos. Somehow the word hot has worked its way into some editions of AWP. The lobe, for example, has tas te coelias xerotatas te caetermotatas. Mysteriously, I find nothing of this in the critical apparatuses of either Diller or Juana. Pros de tutoi sin hoi hydropes kai pleistoi ginontai kai tanato destatoi. Tu gartera os dysenteriae te polai em piptusi kai di aroiai kai piretoi te tartaioi polucronioi. Tauta de ta noselmata me cuncenta tas toiautas pusias es hydropas catistesi kai apoctene. Tauta men autoisi tu teraos gignetai. In addition to these year-round diseases, the dropsies that occur are numerous and fatal, for in the summer there are epidemics of dysentery, diarrhea, and quartan fevers of long duration, and these diseases, when prolonged, dispose to dropsies and kill such constitutions as I have described. These, then, are the maladies that befall them in the summer. Ad haec etiam hydropes plurimi ac letalissimi fiunt, aestat enum ducenteriae mult ac alvi profluia incedunt et febres quartanae de uturnae. Hi aut morbi prolongati tales naturas ad hydropas deducunt ac ocedunt, et he quidem morbi ipsis aestate fiunt. Several of the symptoms mentioned by the author thus far, such as the hardened spleen, spleen menuomenos, and the quartan fever, piretos tetartaios, are thought to be those of malaria. 
which, as you can see from this quote, was very common in the ancient world. Of course, we know that malaria is carried by mosquitoes, especially from stagnant waters. Note the French word for malaria, paludisme, from Latin palus for swamp or marsh. Malaria comes from Italian malaria, bad air. Tu decemonos toisi neoteroisi men peri pneumoniaite kai maniode anosomata. Toisi de presbyteroisi causoi diatentes coelies scleroteta. In the winter, younger men are struck by pneumonia in illnesses attended by delirium. Older men by the fevers called causoi because of the hardness of their cavity. Hit me vero junioribus quidem peri pneumoniae et insaniae morbi. Senioribus vero febres ardentes propter ventris duritium. With respect to the maniode a nosalmata, Jones in the Loeb tells us that the Hippocratic corpus is rich in words meaning delirium of various kinds. Tesi de gunaixin oidemata engignetai kai plegma leucon, kai engastri iscusi molis, kai titusi calapos, megalateta embrua kai oideonta, epeta entesi tropesi thinode ata kai ponera gignetai, hete catharsis tesi gunaixin uc epigenetai creste meta tontocon. Among the women occur swellings and leucoplegmasia, and they conceive rarely and deliver with difficulty, and their newborns are big and swollen, and then in their nursing become consumptive and miserable, and the purgation does not happen in the regular way to women after childbirth, that is, the reestablishment of their menstrual cycle. Mulieribus autem tumores oboriuntur et pituita alba, et wix in ventre concipiunt, ac difficulter pareunt, et foitus magnos ac tumidos, dende ex alimentis tabescentes ac depravati fiunt, et purgatio comoda postpartum mulieribus non contingit. Toisi de paidioisi celae epigignontai malista, cae toisin andrasi cirsoi, cae helcaa in tesi cnemesin, hostetas toiatas pusias ucoionta macrobius enae, ala pro gerasken tu cronu tu hicnomenu. Hernias, according to Juana Scrotal hernias, especially befall children, Varicose veins and ulcers in the legs befall men, so that such constitutions cannot be long-lived, but grow old ahead of time. Pueris vero hernaei ac cedunt, et viris varices, et ulcera in tibia. Quare fitri non potest ut tales naturae longaiwaesent, sed ante temporis adventum senescunt. Eti de hygienaikes do kelsin eken in gastri, kai hokotan hotokos e, apanis de tai to pleroma tes gastros, tuto de gignetai hokotan hydropinesosin hai hysterai. Moreover, the women appear to have conceived, and when the time of delivery comes, the fullness of the belly disappears. This happens whenever the womb suffers from dropsy. Praetera a feminae se in utero habere putant, et ubi partus tempus adest, ventris moles illa ac plenitudo evanescit. Hoc autem contingit ex aqua cum uteri ex aqua concepta laborant. To proceed with chapter 7, Please proceed to the following video in the playlist.